Isaiah 52, verse number 13. No problem. All right. If you're there with me, Isaiah chapter 52, verse number 13, says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were as many were astonied at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall the sprinkle, so how he shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath re believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had no, done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and be, shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this time that we have before us. Father, we thank you so much for your word. May you use it in our lives today. May that which is tainted by this world be done away with. May our sole purpose and our sole delight be to serve you and to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Help us to trust you and every way and help us to acknowledge you and your presence as we go. Father, we ask you to help us to be once again in, in awe of what you have done for us. Father, may you bless this time that we're in your word. May you, through the Holy Spirit, use, use it in our lives. I do pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is, in my opinion, no greater part of Isaiah than in chapter 53. Isaiah is actually one of my favorite books of the Bible. Some people might say, well, you're, uh, you're kind of strange with that. Uh, <laughs> because we like the Gospels. We like the, the stories of the Bible. Those are easy to understand. And true enough, Isaiah is rather difficult. But yet, through the 66 chapters of Isaiah, we see the glories of heaven. We see the glories of the millennial kingdom. We see Christ coming in a way that no other book of the Bible has. 
And specifically, it's interesting to note that Isaiah 53 is actually a banned chapter in certain circles. In the Jewish synagogues, the rab rabbi, when they get to chapter 52, when towards the end, they will skip 53 entirely. Well, why is that? Because they say that if you take Isaiah 53 and just go through the text, it sounds an awful lot like Jesus. And they don't want to say Jesus was the Messiah. And so here in front of us is a, a forbidden book for, for the Jewish people, but it's such a marvelous chapter, such a way of showing us what the Messiah was supposed to be like and what he came to do. The reason for his coming is found in this chapter. This chapter holds a lot of a great uh, passages here, and we're going to go through it. Uh, we're going to see four different viewpoints uh, throughout the, the chapter of Isaiah 53 to gain a better understanding of what Christ did for us that day when he went to the cross so that we would have greater uh, adoration for Christ in what he did for us but also specifically to preach the gospel. And so we're looking forward to Isaiah 53. First of all, number one, we're going to see in verses uh, two through three, the historical viewpoint, the historical viewpoint. Notice with me what it says here. Verse number two, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. First, we see that verse as that of, of seeing Jesus when he came to earth. People that did not know about his miraculous birth, the people that would not know about the angels singing there on that day of, of Christmas morn, we do not uh, for those who don't know that the very fact of, uh, of Jesus being born of a virgin, born miraculously, born in Bethlehem, specifically going with that prophecy in Micah, we see, well, Jesus grew up just like anybody else. Jesus grew up in the town of Nazareth. Nazareth is a little town that isn't very well known for anything. In fact, when one of the disciples came and, and found Jesus and Jesus told him uh, who he was, he found uh, that of Nathaniel. Nathaniel asked the question, is there anything good that comes out of Nazareth? Uh, Come and see is, is the reply that he was given. Is there anything good that comes out of Nazareth? Well, yes. Jesus Christ grew up in the town of Nazareth, and he was born to a carpenter. His, we'll say, stepfather, his real father is the heavenly father, but we have Joseph. And he taught Jesus the trade of carpentry. Now, when we think of the carpentry trade today, we think of splinters, we think of wood, we think of making cabinets, tables, uh, chairs, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, back in those days, the carpentry, the carpenters were actually more like what we say in today are construction workers. So they would help buildings. They would build buildings, not just wooden uh, doors, although that is part of it, but it was actually a part of construction work. And so you think of Joseph as the construction worker. Uh, you think now Jesus growing up in that, in that place as a construction worker. It says here, there was nothing about him that anybody saw that said, well, this is the miraculous one. In a lot of pictures and, and different movies of, uh, that we see Jesus or a, a, a interpretation of what Jesus was like, you always see him with a halo, you know. If he always went around with a halo and that of, you know, the, the sun just beating down and saying, you know, this is the one. If he had a spotlight on himself the entire time that he was on earth, people would start wondering what's the deal with this guy. Because not many people have a spotlight on them as they walk through the city. Nobody has stop spotlights on them when they go into the synagogue. Uh, that doesn't happen. So people are looking at him and saying, well, there's nothing really about you. There's, 
You are the son of Mary and Joseph, they would say, not knowing his miraculous birth or conception. Uh, but yet, he came into prominence in, when he was 30 years old, when he got baptized by John. The, the Holy Spirit came down upon him and rested upon him, showing John the Baptist that this indeed was the Messiah. And from that moment on, for three years, he did what he did, and he had notoriety from the top of, of Israel down to the bottom, that of Judea, that in Samaria, that in uh, the actual Galilee area. He was well known. Word got back to Herod, Herod who had just uh, martyred John the Baptist. And then he said, well, this is obviously John coming back from the dead. People were wondering all about him. Jesus once said to his disciples, who do men say that I am? They said, well, they said Isaiah, or they said Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then he said, who do you say that I am? Love Peter, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. I love Peter's response there. Jesus went and did miraculous work, and yet, though we see him, though in verse number three, the outcome of that would be his own death. Verse number three, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. That would be the very scene of the crucifixion itself, the trials before it. And your sanctified imaginations, go back there with me. If we are the part of the crowd there witnessing all these events, we would see Jesus, the one that we've heard all about, the one that was called a miracle worker, the one that raised the dead. We heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead after being dead for four days. Wow! What an amazing prophet of God. But now something peculiar happened. We see the same miracle worker, the same prophet going through the streets and the high priest and all the other priests are denouncing him. They came before that of the Sanhedrin. They denounced him. They went now before that of Pilate himself, the local ruler of the area of Jerusalem. And he is looking at him and he says, well, you, got, you guys uh, judge him according to your own law. And they said, nope, that's not going to do. Only by the Romans can somebody be crucified. And so Pilate then interrogates him. Who are you? They say that you're a king. Is that true? I love his response. Yeah, my kingdom's not of this world. If it was, my disciples would take it by force. But no, that's not my way. My kingdom's not of this world. And so he then says, oh, you're, you're a king. Well, okay. And then he goes out and says, okay, I, I find no guilt in this man. I have found him not guilty. And then the, the priests, you know, are in an uproar. Then when he hears about the very fact that he's from Nazareth, oh, whoa, whoa, out of my jurisdiction, Herod's in town, let's take him there. Go take him to Herod and let him decide this. So they take him through the streets. Many people are angry with him, much hatred towards him. Jesus goes to Herod. Herod wants to see a, a, a magic show. He doesn't care about truth. And so Jesus says not a word. And comes back to Pilate. Pilate wanting nothing really to do with this person. In fact, he was warned by his own wife not to have anything to do with this man. Because of, of, the, tr of the dreams that she has dreamt that day. Do not do anything with that just man. So he's trying to release him. So he decided, okay, well what I'm going to do is I'm going to scourge him. I'm going to make it so that you all will feel sorry for him, and then you'll say, fine, that's enough. And so he was punished by that of the Praetorian guards. He was mocked. He was crowned with a crown of thorns. They gave him a staff, said, hail, king of the Jews, mocking him, taking the staff, and then hitting him on that head with driving the thorns into his brow. And then after all of that, he came out, Pilate says to the crowd, 
Behold the man. And what they said turns the stomach and the heart. Crucify him. Crucify him. What has he done wrong? Crucify him. Crucify him. And trying to figure out a way still to get him released, they then, the crowd says, by specifically the priests, they say, if you are, a, if you think this guy is a king, then you are no friend to Caesar. And he says, will you now denounce your king? There, we have no king but Caesar. And so Pilate then took water in front of him, washed his hands and says, all right, I have washed my hands of from guilt, from the innocency of this man, you will now have to go and crucify him. And so they take Jesus on the hard road from where he was before Pilate all the way to Mount of uh, Golgotha, what we call a Calvary. Carrying his own cross, he stumbles. Seeing that he needed help, a Roman soldier grabbed Simon and said, you need to carry it for him. And as they get closer and closer to that final destination, he sees the women weeping. And Jesus says, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves. For now judgment has come upon the house of Israel. And so he went to Golgotha, the place of the skull it's translated as. They nailed him to the cross. And after lifting up him up high, what they would do is then put him into the, a hole in the ground that would cause him to jar down. And now he is there crucified in front of everybody around. Crucifixion is terrible, not because of being nailed to the cross, although that would be extremely painful, but the way that crucifixion is the death of a person is that the person would have to force himself up in order to take a breath. So every time he would force himself up, no matter the pain in his feet, he would then breathe. And eventually he would lose strength and die by suffocation. That's usually how people die on the cross. There at the cross, you see the people around him. Some mock him. Some say, you healed others. Come save yourself. If you are indeed the Christ, come off the cross. And so he is there and he hears all the mockings. He even hears the mockings of the two criminals next to him. And he says over and over again, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And with that, time goes by. The women at the cross, there you see Mary. Nobody around knows exactly what's going on. The song, Mary, Did You Know, is sung at Christmas time a lot. Here should be another point of, Mary, did you know what you would have to go through? Mary, did you know that your son will be on the cross, dying? Mary, did you know all the agony he has to go through at this point in time? I'm sure maybe uh, intellectually she knew Isaiah 53 and knew that that was the, what Jesus had to go through, but yet now she feels it. She sees it, heartbroken. His disciples are nearby. Well, the women disciples are, are nearby, and they look and they weep. John, the beloved disciple, is there, and Jesus says specifically, Woman, your son, pointing with his motion in his voice to John. And then, John, your mother. And so John would take care of Mary from that point on. And there at that point, you see all the, the Roman soldiers at the, at the foot of the cross throwing the dice to see who would get 
Jesus' clothes, specifically one tunic that he had. And then at that point, he sees, he says, a line, I thirst. And it's not about him being physically thirsty at this point, though he was. In my thought, it is because he is asking for the cup that is the wrath of God that will be poured upon him at that moment in time. All of God's wrath stored up from the beginning of the world to the end of all the sin that has ever committed is poured upon him at that one moment in time. He thirsts. And then he dies after he prays and gives up the ghost. We see this all in verse number three. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. That's what the people of the day saw this. They saw a man being executed because of him being a criminal, but what was his crime? They did not understand what was going on. Not even the disciples knew all the ins and outs about what's going on. They knew that Jesus died. We see this as the historical viewpoint here in Isaiah 53. We know that Jesus died, and that is historically accurate as to what the Gospels say. But now, number two, we're going to see the theological viewpoint. Why did he die? is the question that comes to mind for those who are reading this, this chapter. Who, why, well, we see him dying, but why did he have to die? In verse number four, we see, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Verse 6. We, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Notice with me what it says here. In verse number 8, and he was taken from prison, from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Here we see Jesus Christ, the Messiah to come, the King of the Jews, the one that would usher in the kingdom that everybody looked forward to, that was one week from this point before on the Sunday, Palm Sunday, that everybody ushered him as the king to come into Jerusalem. Hosanna in the highest. But now they're cursing at him, saying, if you are indeed the Messiah, if you are indeed are the king of the Jews, come off the cross. But they did not know what they were doing in doing so, he says all throughout the scriptures that he lays down his life because he is the good shepherd. He said, oh, I love Bruce's Sunday school this morning, when he goes into the temple, or beginning of his ministry, he throws over the, the tables of the money changers and says, how dare you do this in my father's house? My father's house is a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. Then all the, all the high priests, all the, the priests there come to him, all the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of them come to him demanding, by what authority do you do these things? And he says, I'll give you a sign. Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Destroy this temple and I'll raise it. Now they had no clue what he was talking about. Well, this temple? It took so long for this temple to be built. You're going to raise it up in three days? No. They didn't understand what he was speaking of was himself. Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. He gave his life a ransom for many. I love the very fact that in 1 John it says that he became our propitiation. It's a fancy word meaning that of the atoned sacrificial sacrifice. 
the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He is on the cross, and He became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. I love this, that God commanded His love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's why He had to die. He had to die to take all of our punishment on Himself. If a person says, well, sin is terrible, but it's not that bad, then Jesus died a not-so-bad death. But understand, sin is ever so grievous to God. He says in the very beginning, you know, the, the, the easiest, um, and I think the, the one that we would say, well, that's not too bad, is the sin of taking the tree from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you honestly think about it, it was like, okay, well, that doesn't sound like a big deal. But he says, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And with that, Eve took, ate, gave to Adam. And with the bite and eating of that fruit that Adam had, he gave upon us the entirety of the sinful nature. From that point forward, we are all come into this world as sinners by nature, and we prove it by sinning. And every single sin, if you think the grave sins or the small sins in our human minds, if we say, well, okay, that all of it is bad. Every single one of the sins that we ever commit, that have ever committed, it all put Jesus on the cross. He died Becoming sin for us so that he can forgive us our sin. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And because he did that for us. Oh, we have so much to look forward to. We see the theological viewpoint of the giving of Jesus Christ. Why did the Messiah have to die? It's because he had to pay for all of our sins. But not only that, number three, the uh, prof, uh, profiten, profitential viewpoint. I made up this word just because it, it suits well. Uh, profitential, P-R-O-F-I-T, profit, okay? And so we see the profit that, that Jesus did because of the fact that Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins. Now, because of that, we have much profit, Notice with me what it says here, verse number 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Stop right there. Wait a minute, wait a minute. In this one verse alone, you see, it hath pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief, to execute this servant. But on the other hand, he said, I'm going to prolong his days. Well, which one is it? And it's both. He died on the cross, but then three days later, he, just as he said he would, rose from the grave. He rose from the grave triumphantly. He grows from the grave, defeating sin, defeating death itself, defeating the works of Satan. Everything up until this point is looking forward to this coming of Christ. And now he is here. He died on the cross. Three days later, death could not hold him. He then rose up from the grave. And because of that, we have everything to look forward to. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we do not have a martyred uh, saint that we look up to. Rather, we have a living Savior. He is living. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. (laughs) Salvation to impart. I know that he lives. He lives within my heart. We have a marvelous Savior, the prophet that Jesus Christ did for us. Amazing. Notice with me what it also says in verse number 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. He shall bear their 
iniquities. The fact that you and I could be saved is a miracle of God. This thing of justification, just to put it plainly, what is that? That's God's judicial way of declaring us innocent when we clearly are guilty. Jesus Christ became guilty for us. So because of the shed blood of Christ on the cross, he now cleanses us from all sin and God judicially say, not guilty. For each and every person that comes to Jesus Christ. I love it. We are justified. Uh, my righteous servant justify many. Verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. Notice with me in Isaiah 52, verse number 13. It says, Behold, this kind of sums up the entirety of the passage. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, showed himself to be alive 40 days to his disciples with infallible proofs. Now he is ascended on high, waiting for the day for his coming back. And when he comes back in the clouds of glory, his church will be taken to him. Waiting the seven-year tribulation, we're there in heaven, watching and marveling what God does. The prophet of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is so much that we can barely say the, the little bit of it. But it's so much. Because of his Sacrificial death on the cross, we are adopted into his family for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. I love it. Last but not least, the practical point of view. Here's one verse that I'll sum it all up and give the question for us. Verse, verse number one of chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The question for each and every one here today, have you ever received Jesus as your own personal Savior? It's not hard to do so. Putting your faith means that you understand that He is the only way to heaven. The Bible is clear. You understand that, there, that we ourselves are not good enough, nor can we be good enough. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags compared to the holiness of God. But through Jesus Christ, he did what we could not do and die in our place. And by taking him as your own personal savior, he gives you the gift of everlasting life. The gift of forgiveness of sins. The gift of adoption into his family. The gift, and we can go on and on about the gifts. But have you ever done that? I pray that you do so today. For those who are of us that are saved... Are we living in light of what Christ did for us? He died in our place. Oh, so much we should do for him. He bought us with a price, the precious blood of his, own, of his own blood. What are we doing for him? Are we living uh, spotlessly from this world? Or are we tainted? Are we tainted with the sin that so easily doth beset us? Perhaps somebody here might say, well... I have this sin that I keep on going back to. But I'm going to decide that through God's power, I'm going to get, a, get rid of that sin in my life. Perhaps somebody here has not a sin, but a hindrance in their life with their walk before God. Whatever it might be, we're going to have a time. Let's go ahead and have every head bowed, every eyes closed. And we'll have a moment of silence for us to just pray before God. And then I'll finish this up with a uh, prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and how amazing you are. How great and glorious are your works. There's so many of them we cannot but say a very tiny portion of it. All the, all the books in the world would be filled if they just knew of all that you have done for us and all the 
nuances of every decision that was made and given us the ability to come to saving knowledge in Christ, that Christ came into the world not to do his own will, but yet yours. For him, obeying even unto death, even the death of the cross, you have highly exalted him, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Father, we thank you for each person here. If there's somebody that has received Christ as their own personal Savior, we celebrate that. Father, we, we ask you to help us to draw nearer and nearer to you. And especially this time that we're going to celebrate the, the Lord's table. May it be special for us. May it be precious in our eyes. And may we be right before you and other people. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.